Okay, once again, uh, you're all welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you for joining us. And uh, as I said earlier, I'm uh, Afko Jonpo. I work with the uh, Youth for Tax Justice Network. I'm glad that you've all joined uh, this uh, webinar today uh, on the topic around wealth taxes. We are going to discuss uh, wealth taxes from a broader perspective, try to understand uh, why they are important in uh, the context of uh, the East Africa community. Also try to understand whether wealth taxes are the magic bullet which can uh, solve uh, the inequality crisis we are having, whether they can also solve the debt crisis that we are uh, plunged in as the East Africa region, but also find out and explore whether wealth taxes can uh, inspire economic activity and uh, uh, help improve uh, economic activity in uh, in the region. You know, uh, since we are having a lot of initiatives aimed at uh, improving economic activity in the region, we want to find out whether wealth taxes can uh, be a bonus. And uh, with me here today, ladies and gentlemen, I have uh, a panel of uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen to unpack this topic for us today and uh, understand it. And I'll uh, introduce them uh, one by one. I hope uh, my panelists do not take offense. Uh, I know you have very big CVs. You are important people. You are known far and wide. I don't think one or two words can describe you ably. But I will try. I'll give it a try. And I will start with uh, with uh, uh, with uh, Council Birunji Sefas. Uh, unfortunately, he is not able to join us today. But uh, he has sent a unable representative, but I will still introduce him because uh, whatever is going to be presented is going to be, is what he prepared to be shared uh, in this webinar. So, also, Birunji Sefas is a founder and the managing director of uh, Birunji Barata Associates. He's also a tax agent uh, with the Uganda Registry, Uganda Revenue Authority in Uganda, and is a member of uh, the International Bar Tax, tax Committee. He has also worked with uh, the Minister of Finance in Uganda and the Uganda Revenue Authority in the past. Uh, 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 Council Cephas is going to be taking us through uh, how uh, wealth taxes are manifested in our laws, but also give some sort of a brief overview of wealth taxation in, uh, in, uh, in the East Africa community. Uh, once again, thank you very much for joining us. I know he's not here, but uh, the representative, and I mean Jacqueline, for standing in for him and uh, giving us the time and the sharing us with us, uh, this wisdom is going to share with us. Thank you very much. Then uh, I'll also I'll now go on to Dr. Laila Latif. Uh, I think uh, Doctor needs no introduction, but uh, she is a Kenyan-based lawyer. She specializes in corporate tax and transactions law. She's uh, a PhD holder uh, in wealth tax and uh, financing public health. She's, a, she's also a technical expert with the United Nations and Development Program, uh, which deals in training ministries of finance on linking tax to the achievement of uh, the sustainable development goals and uh, by focusing on wealth taxation. So when you hear this introduction, you know that uh, we are with, uh, uh, with the fountain of <laughs> The person who is most knowledgeable about those taxes amid the is amid the stars. So we, we, we cannot expect, we cannot hope for any more. Thank you very much, Dr. Laila, for joining us. And uh, uh, we are looking forward to your insights. I'll now move on to Ishmael Zulu. Ishmael Zulu is uh, a policy officer at the Tax Justice Network Africa. Uh, he's also a development economist with over seven years experience in a civil society space at national and regional levels. Uh, Ishmael is going to talk about the political economy of uh, wealth taxation. I mean, uh, uh, we are going to learn which countries are imposing wealth taxes, but uh, Ishmael is going to delve into the, the politics around the wealth taxes. Why are they being uh, imposed the way they are? Why not? What drives them being imposed in, in such a manner? So we are very much looking forward to your discussions, Ishmael, and thank you very much for joining us. I'll now move on to... Uh, Alan Muhere Zamranja uh, is uh, the team lead at uh, Youth for Tax Justice Network. Uh, he's also a co-founder of uh, uh, Youth for Tax Justice Network, a Pan-African organization working towards uh, meaningful youth 
participation in uh, influencing decision making on resource mobilization, allocation, and utilization in Africa, specifically for the benefit of the young people. Thank you very much, Alan, for joining us. He's going to be talking about, uh, he's going to be dissecting this topic of inequality, especially when it, we are talking about uh, the marginalized groups of uh, youth, women, and children. And of course, he's going to be linking this with uh, wealth taxation. I'll now conclude with uh, Mr. Rangrelai Chikova. Thank you very much, Ranga, for joining us. Ranga is uh, an economic governance officer within the Pan-African Lawyers Union Good Governance and Rule of Law portfolio. He has also worked with uh, the Zimbabwe Coalition on Data Development and also the African Forum and Network on Data and Development. Ranga is going to dissect the topic of uh, whether wealth taxes are the magic bullet to solving the debt crisis that uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, our apologies for that short technical glitch. But uh, yeah, so these are our panelists and uh, panelists, you're most welcome uh, to uh, this session. My name is Gabriel Achai. I'll be standing in for uh, Mr. John Kafka while he tries to get back on. But uh, we're still discussing uh, wealth taxation. And uh, it's at this point that I would like to invite our first speaker, Dr. Leila Latif, to uh, make her presentation to the topic. So, Dr. Leila, you are welcome to make your presentation. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks so much. Um, we've lost John, but uh, we hope he will be back. So, I'll just go straight to... Great. Uh, where do I... Just one minute, please. We can start. Okay. Are my is my screen loaded up? Yes, 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 it's loaded, Dr. Leila. Okay, thank you. So, right. Okay, so welcome everyone to the important discussion on wealth taxation. And what I want to start by saying is that there are always two things that are always certain in life. One is taxes, and the other one is death. We all know that we're going to eventually die. We also know that we must pay taxes. And if you don't pay tax on your income, you will definitely pay it on the bread that you buy, the shoes that you buy, the clothes that you buy as VAT, right? So generally, when we speak about taxes, taxes are the domain of uh, domestic revenue mobilization, which basically means that governments have the authority to look for local funds with which to finance their annual budget. Now, part of the discourse on domestic revenue mobilization from an intellectual or um, political perspective is the need to move or advance our tax system to one that is fair and sustainable. Fair, basically in the sense that each taxpayer is taxed based on his capacity and his earnings, the more you earn, the more you are taxed. That is the classic definition of progressive taxation. When we say fair, we also mean it in the sense that the tax burden is spread equitably across all taxpayers. So if tax incentives are provided to multinational corporations, they should also be provided to small and um, medium-sized enterprises. When we speak of a sustainable tax system, that is one that can be maintained over a period of time. It is a tax system that is predictable and consistent. So when we speak of the tax on wealth or wealth taxation, it is basically considered to be part of this fair and sustainable tax system. And I'll tell you why. Fair, because the rich should pay more. They should pay in proportion to what they earn and accumulate. Fairness in the taxation of wealth it basically ensures that there's no widespread income inequality. And when we say sustainable in the sense of wealth taxation, it's in the sense that wealth, when invested, it generates more wealth. Now think of Jeff Bezos, right? He started off with a mere hundreds of dollars as, and is basically now make, making billions. If his net worth, which is at 200 billion, I think that was the amount before his divorce, right? If that 200 billion, suppose, is taxed at an annual rate 
of 0.5%, it will generate 1 billion US dollars each year. Now that annual generation of 1 billion is what we're referring to as ensuring a sustainable source of taxable income. Now, if you compare this with suppose a one-off payment on Bezos net worth at 5%, it will just generate a one-off 10 billion. So when we're thinking about wealth taxation and we want to introduce wealth taxation in the East Africa um, you know, countries, we've got to ask ourselves, do we think of this as a one-off or as an annual? It's a real political issue. And the political aspects of this is going to be discussed by our panelist, uh, Ishmael, going forward. Now, when we speak of wealth taxation, that's the question, right? The big question, what do we mean? Now, the fact that the shares you hold have increased in value and you're paying the capital gains tax on that increase, is that what we mean by wealth tax? So in East Africa, especially in Rwanda, the capital gains tax is at 5%. In Kenya, it's at 15%. So when we speak of CGT, is that what we're referring to when we say wealth taxation? Or if, for example, generational wealth is inherited by you and you have to now pay a tax on this inheritance. Is that to be understood as a tax on wealth? Those are the questions I'm putting, it, putting to you all to think about. Now, many countries already impose tax on gains that are made. So that's the capital gains tax or also on property taxation. Now, these countries are basically taxing forms of wealth. But this tax is not classified as a wealth tax. The wealth tax that I am here to discuss with you today, and so are my panelists, is basically the net worth of millionaires and billionaires, a tax on their wealth. So for a fair and sustainable tax system, to be put in place, there is a need, a serious need to tax global capital situated in the hands of a few. We should have legislation that is titled wealth tax, right? So that there is clarity on what this tax means to avoid duplication. Now, um, I must say, you know, at the outset, that wealth taxation can pose a problem of double taxation. Now, thinking of this, um, Suppose that you've been earning your income, legitimately, I hope, and your income is taxed, right? And then you go ahead and save 30% of your income over a period of, say, 30 years. Now, these are your savings. Then suppose the wealth tax is introduced and your savings are now subjected to further taxation. So is this not double taxation? Is this fair? Those are the things that I want you to reflect on as we go ahead with the discussion on wealth taxation. Now shift your understanding to multinational corporations and we justify why a wealth tax is really a necessity in the economic situation that we are in. So multinational corporations, they shift their profits to low tax jurisdictions, to tax havens, to countries where they can get exemptions. And then these profits are paid to their shareholders in countries where there is little or very minimal withholding tax on dividends. Now, these shareholders benefit from manipulating tax systems and they get, of course, you know, super duper rich in the long run. It's fair to impose the wealth tax on their wealth. So these are the considerations you ought to have when you're beginning to think about the wealth tax. Now, let's go a little bit into Uganda. Now, there isn't a specific category for wealth taxation in Uganda, but their tax administration has what we call a high net, a high net worth individuals register. Now, is this to be considered a form of wealth taxation? It is more, instead, it is more of an oversight and accountability measure than a tax that is imposed. So Uganda doesn't have, for example, a 1.5% tax on high net worth individuals, but rather it has a register of high net worth individuals whom they scrutinize 
to assess how much tax they have paid based on what they own. So for example, if a high net worth individual say they own three or four buildings and they drive a luxurious car, this will be matched with how much in tax this individual has paid. So if he's paid negligible or minimal taxation, a tax audit will be conducted. And this approach has actually led to increase in tax compliance. And this is a good thing. So when you're thinking about wealth taxation, think also in terms of, uh, of compliance. Okay, so where in the world is wealth taxed? Not as a, you know, tax on transfer of wealth, for example, you know, inheritance tax, or as an increase of monetary value, such as the capital gains tax that we are familiar with, right? There are five countries currently that apply a wealth tax. We've got Spain. Um, Spain basically applies a wealth tax payable on the total net value of an individual's asset worth over 1 million euros. And that wealth tax ranges from 0.2 to 3.5%. In Switzerland, um, the different cantons, right? So the different uh, local governments, they apply a wealth tax to individuals with a, with a net worth of over Swiss francs, 100,000. So their rate really depends across the local governments. Norway also applies a wealth tax to individuals with a net worth of over Norwegian kroners. I think that's 1.5 million. And their range of the tax rate is between 0.15% to 0.7%. But you see, there are some super rich people in Norway who do not want their wealth to be taxed. So what they have done, some of them, they've actually moved to Switzerland, where apparently the rate is much lower. Now, France also applies. France doesn't apply a wealth tax. It applies what they call a solidarity wealth tax to individuals with a net worth of over 1.3 million uh, euros and their tax rate ranges from 0.5% to 1.5%. And then we've got Argentina. And you can see so far, we don't have any single African country here that is uh, imposing the wealth tax. Argentina is the closest developing country that we see. So they also apply a solidarity contribution on individuals with a net worth of Argentina pesos, 200 million, and their rate is between two to 3.5%. Okay, so that is basically where wealth is being targeted as a separate category of taxation. Great. Um, I'll now share some statistics with you. The Oxfam report for 2021, the inequality virus, they tell us that we already have 2,153 2, billionaires globally. The 10 richest billionaires have a combined wealth of over 1 trillion US dollars. Then they say, the report, right? If these people, the 10 richest billionaires were to be taxed at 1%, it would generate 22 billion in taxes. If they were taxed at 5% annually, we would be seeing 110 billion in taxes. My question to you is, fine, these billionaires are perhaps situated in the US or in other European countries. If their wealth is going to be taxed, it's going to benefit their countries that tax is not going to benefit African countries in terms of economic development. So I'm posing this question here for you because I want you to think about the fact that do we need to have a global wealth tax fund or do we need to think about imposing wealth tax at our national level? Then there's another report by Credit Sui 2021. They also said that the total global wealth has been estimated at 400 and 18 trillion US dollars. Now, this amount, 43% of this amount is concentrated among the top 1% of the world's population. That is significantly, you know, unequal. That's what's causing the divide between the rich and the poor. And I think this is where my colleagues are, Alan, Ishmael, um, and Ranga would be able to unpack this going further. So we're also saying, we're seeing in, in this Credit Sui report that there are about 56.1 million millionaires. Now this basically justifies the need to tax their wealth because where else are we going to get the money from to mitigate against growing debt and debt distress that we are seeing our countries in? 
Where are we going to get more funds to pay for the loss and damage fund as a mitigation measure against climate risk, for example? Where else will we get more money to support state budget so that the only option is not to what we're seeing in Kenya, increase taxes on individuals, income uh, on VAT, to remove subsidies and impose new levies such as, you know, the housing levy and carbon taxes. So it's got to be through taxing the wealth of billionaires and millionaires. So we have, what we're seeing already at the global level is that we are having wealth tax proposals that are being discussed in these global platforms, right? So we're already seeing that the US, they've said that they're looking forward, the Biden administration, um, that they want to try and impose a 2% wealth tax on net worth of over 50 million US dollars and a 3% wealth tax on net worth over US dollars 1 billion. Whether they would be able to achieve this or not, it remains to be seen. In the UK, they're also looking to introduce a 1.5% wealth tax on individuals with assets over 750,000 pounds. I think as of yesterday, they have decided to not go forward with this proposal. In Germany, they're also looking at imposing a 1% wealth tax on individuals with a net worth of over 2 million euros. In Canada, they're looking at 1% on individuals' net worth over Canadian dollars, 20 million. Here we have an African country, South Africa. Now they're looking to impose a 3% wealth tax on individuals with a net worth of, uh, you know, South Africa rand 3.7 million. And then we have Colombia. At 1.25%, they want to impose that wealth tax as a one off on individuals with a net worth of, I think, Colombian pesos, 5 billion. So you see, the great part about these proposals is that the millionaires and billionaires themselves, they have issued a statement saying that they want to be taxed. <clears throat> and we're also seeing that the US is on the same page on taxing wealth. So if you want to read more about the uh, millionaires and billionaires statement, there's a website called the patrioticmillionaires.org. It will provide you with more information on that. Now, what would a wealth tax for East Africa mean? So I found this and I wanted to share this with you. Quite interesting. According to the 2022 Knight Frank Wealth Report, we have 10,257 more individuals who have joined the League of the World's High Net Worth Individuals with a net worth of more than 1 million US dollars in Africa. So if you I'll, I can zoom this, yeah. So Kenya has added 39 more dollar millionaires. Tanzania has added more 14, 45 dollar millionaires. I think South Africa has the highest at $3,800 millionaires. And Nigeria comes next with, uh, no, actually Egypt with $1,300 millionaires. And then Nigeria with $1,068 millionaires. So, you know, my question would then be like, do we know who our local millionaires and billionaires are, whom we can subject to a wealth tax? Will it be politically possible to have a wealth tax legislation when those to be subject to this tax will be maybe our dear politicians and owners of uh, private entities that, you know, fund these their election campaigns? But at least we have some data that suggests that there are millionaires, dollar millionaires in Africa, and we can think about strategic, strategically what sort of wealth taxation should we be introducing within the East Africa region. Mm. Okay, sorry. So, uh, one moment. Okay, yeah. Um, but you see, there will always be challenges to introducing the wealth tax in the East Africa region. So what we need to do is that we have to first assess what our current tax system is like. Is it capable to introduce wealth taxation? Because we're already seeing from the start, we have the capital gains tax that's also considered as a form of tax on wealth. So if we have CGT, 
and then we go ahead and impose another wealth taxation is that not increasing the burden on the common taxpayer is that not introducing us into the realm of double taxation we've got to be able to assess our current tax system to be able to see how viable and feasible a wealth tax you know could basically be and whether our tax administration has the capacity to administer the wealth tax in the first place so for me what's very important is that if we're Hello. Hello, doctor. I think we did we just lose Dr. Laila. I think we lost Dr. Laila. Uh as we wait for her to come back, I think uh she raised very, very, very critical issues, uh, which uh, are going to lead us into the next discussion. I know she was uh, trying to give us uh, a glimpse into the challenges we face in the East Africa community on how we can, uh, where we can start from uh, the things we have to sort out to impose a uh, wealth tax. But uh, she raised very important issues and uh, especially the issue of uh, identifying the millionaires. She talked about, uh, having uh, a boom, a millionaire boom in East Africa community ever since uh, the COVID-19 pandemic. And uh, it is very interesting that we now have so many millionaires, over 100,000 uh, something, especially in the East Africa community, plus, uh, of course, Nigeria and the rest of Africa. And uh, this basically leads me into the next uh, panelist, Ishmael. Ishmael is going to talk about the political economy. And I wanted us to hear from you, Ishmael. And uh, I mean, coming from uh, Dr. Laila's presentation around, around uh, identifying the millionaires and uh, whether these are uh, people and uh, assuming that they are the politicians who are, in, uh, who are holding power in, uh, in, uh, in Africa, whether they can uh, vouch for you know, uh, the legislation on a wealth tax since they are going to be uh, the victims. But also, uh, Dr. Laila also talked about uh, the high net worth individuals and identifying them, which uh, perhaps also relates to the millionaires. She also she cited the, 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 the Ugandan case where the Revenue Authority has a list of uh, high net worth individuals. So perhaps, oh, I can see hmm. Dr. Laila is back. Perhaps we can give her the opportunity to finish. Then we can come back to you, Ishmael. Dr. Laila, can you hear me now? I'm so sorry. For some reason, Zoom decided to update. I'm very <laughs> sorry for this. Apologies. Uh, it's okay. It's okay, Zoom. Doctor. You can go ahead. <laughs> for Lenny Sana, thank you for being understanding. Um, I think I stopped at the challenges. Um, at the challenges, yes, please. So I'll just, yeah. So I said, when we're looking at the current um, tax system and we want to assess it in terms of understanding if we need to impose the wealth tax, I think what is important is for us to start with defining what the wealth tax really means. So how does, what sort of an African characterization can we give the wealth tax? Yeah, because we can't have the measurement of the US that if you have a net worth of 2 billion US dollars, for example, then we'll tax you at 5%. We have to come up with our own local threshold so to be able to have that maximization of how we can increase our domestic revenue mobilization. And then we also need to think about how will we define the wealth tax base in the first place? What tax rate will we set? Will there be any exemptions to be provided for the rich? And most importantly, if we want to introduce the wealth tax towards what sort of priorities will the wealth tax be um, um, you know, applied to it? So for example, will the wealth tax be redistributed towards the achievement of 
I don't know, sustainable development goal one, which is all about reducing poverty, or will it be aligned towards the achievement of sustainable development goal number three, which is about improving um, universal health access to public health care. Also, we need to think about how will we regulate a wealth tax framework, particularly where assets of a wealthy Tanzanian, for example, are situated in multiple jurisdictions like the Bahamas, in Dubai, in Mauritius, in Kenya. What sort of international cooperation will we need if we have individuals with assets, you know, citizens with assets in different countries to be able to say, this is your network, therefore you need to be able to pay an X amount as part of the wealth taxation. So now let's also just think um, um, realistically, right? Um, where really are these dollar billionaires, millionaires located? What comes to the top of my mind is New York, Geneva, London, Dubai, Qatar, Russia, and these are not really African sounding countries. So the most impact in terms of revenue gain in imposing this wealth taxation will be in these countries, especially the US. So wouldn't it make sense therefore to think of a global wealth tax so that there is established what you're seeing here on the screen as a global wealth tax fund in which the tax of the wealth of these millionaires and billionaires would be deposited and redistributed from, you know, to, to basically maybe finance um, country priorities such as creating economic uh, opportunities, enhancing job opportunities, developing tech, artificial intelligence. But basically, whatever method you choose, whether you take the global wealth tax approach or another approach, there are always going to be pros and cons. So one of the um, cons for having the global wealth tax is the sovereignty concerns. Many countries may be unwilling to cede control over their tax policies to a global body, as taxation is often seen as a key aspect of national sovereignty, but the pro for this is uniformity. A global wealth tax would provide a consistent framework for all participating countries, reducing complexity and ensuring equal treatment of uh, basically all taxpayers. So if you are to design, I'm asking this as a question to, to the participants, if you are to design a global wealth tax fund, what would it look like? Yeah. But if you were to design a domestic wealth tax for Kenya, Uganda, Rwanda, you name it, what sort of a design would make sense? And instead of looking at the pros and cons on the screen, you think of what would be the strengths or weaknesses of introducing a wealth tax in our countries. Yeah. So, hmm. As I wrap up now and let Ishmael come in, I want to say that we should not, and, and I really believe this, impose additional tax burden on individual pairs. You know, income should not be taxed at high rates because this gives individuals the incentive to then invest and save this and save and basically this generates a culture of uh, you know wealth within societies within communities so instead tax should be imposed on corporations and these um and these and 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 not these but the wealthy population right those who are concentrated with the millions of shillings not just millions of dollars because they can cushion themselves since they have multiple measures through which to access capital in the first place. So introducing a well thought out wealth tax legislative framework can really, really support closing the gap between the poor and the rich. It can, what is wrong with my screen? Yeah, it can really um, plug the growing inequality that we are witnessing in terms of income inequality, technological, uh, technological inequality, resource inequalities, etc. A wealth, a wealth um, tax can be a sustainable measure for a country like Kenya to reduce its reliance on, you know, excessive debt. But the wealth tax is also a politically contentious issue, right? And our panelists will now carry this uh, conversation going forward in terms of unpacking these themes in greater detail. So, for me to conclude at this stage is to simply say that um, when we think about the wealth taxation, we also have this concept 
under the Islamic legal system of zakat, which is a form of a tax on wealth, which is already available in most of the East African countries, and it generates a substantial amount of money. So even as lawyers, when we think about tax, we shouldn't really think of conventional forms of taxation. Most of these taxes that have been designed for us are colonial in their nature. We never had the chance to design our own fiscal systems. We already just um, you know, adopted the colonial model of taxation. So as we think about multiple forms of taxation, we should ask ourselves, what are the present locally existing taxes that have been on this continent for a long time? Zakat features as a wealth tax, and maybe we can have a separate webinar on that some other time to really understand what it means for East Africa. But for now, I'll leave you with a question. You know, you've heard about a background on wealth taxation, the challenges around wealth taxation, uh, the countries that impose this wealth tax and the need for why we need to have wealth tax will be unpacked greatly by the panelists who are going to be coming in. Then the question is, what is the role of the East Africa lawyers as well as the East Africa Law Society to take this conversation further? I'll stop here and send it back to my chair. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Laila. That was very insightful. That was very informative. I hope we are learning a, a thing or two as uh, lawyers in the East Africa community. Thank you very much. And I think you uh, set the perfect foundation for Ishmael uh, to talk about uh, the political economy around the uh, imposition of uh, a wealth tax in, uh, in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the East Africa community. Ishmael, uh, as I was uh, telling you just before Dr. Laila came back, uh, she had talked about uh, the high net worth individuals, the millionaire boom in, uh, in East Africa, and uh, the issue of identifying the millionaires. Uh, she talked about the challenges as well when it comes to uh, if we are to impose a wealth tax. But she also talked about the good side. I mean, uh, if we can uh, be able to, 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 to impose wealth taxes, we shall be able to generate as much uh, uh, revenues for our countries and all that. So I wanted you, uh, Ishmael, to address some of those issues, especially around uh, uh, the high net worth individuals, the millionaire boom, and the imposition of uh, legislation around wealth taxes, especially since uh, uh, I know Dr. didn't point out the, 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 the millionaires, but we all know that uh, many times they are the politically powerful people. Uh, so I wanted you to, to, to discuss that uh yeah you can take it up ismail thank you so much thank you so much chair um chair just before i start could you confirm with me if you can see my screen yes i can all right great yeah thank, thank you thank you so much um as was introduced at the start, my name is uh, Zulu Zulu Ishmael. I work with Tax Justice Network Africa, which, as you may know, is based in Kenya, in Nairobi. Um, but by nationality, I am a Zambian um, who is working in uh, Lusaka. So it is a pleasure to sit on the panel with the different uh, panelists and then also looking forward to sharing experiences with um, the participants also. So thank you so much for that introduction, John. And um, as you have put it, I'll be responding to what you have mentioned and I'll be focusing on the impact of uh, world taxes on the economic activity within the region. And then I'll also touch on the political aspects of implementing uh, world taxes. Uh, in the East Africa region also. So um, to get started there, I have this diagram, which uh, I obtained. And um, we're looking at the distribution of wealth in Africa. And this is uh, as of 2021. So from the, from the diagram, you will see already that um, wealth inequality is something that has been a challenge uh, on the African continent. And not just in Africa, this is something that is a global challenge. As many countries such as the United States and Europe the conversations of the wealth tax are also coming back to the fore, given the high levels of wealth inequality. So on the African continent, we have already challenges with income inequality, but then there's also the dimension of wealth inequality, which is actually greater than income inequality. So if you look to my far right here, you look at Africa in general, and the blue bar here 
means represents the wealth which is held by the richest 10%. So just to paint a picture, this means that the richest 10% of people on the African continent own over 70% of the wealth of the African continent. Um, then the richest 1% hold over 36% of the wealth on the African continent. So you can already see that on the African continent, the distribution of wealth um, is, not, is not fair, it's not equitable. Um, and then skipping over to East Africa on the far left here, um, you see that where there's greatest inequality is in Southern Africa here, um, followed by Middle Africa or Central Africa, and then East Africa is third, with the high, third highest levels of uh, uh, skewed wealth distribution. So the wealth inequality is third highest in East Africa, where um, the richest 10% hold around 69% of the wealth in East Africa, and then the richest 1% hold over 34% of the wealth. So you can already see where this conversation of the wealth tax is stemming from. There is, there is unfair and unequitable distribution of the wealth on the African continent. And this is a big, big challenge because it means that the wealth of the continent is concentrated in a few hands. Um, and this, this in itself raises the need for a wealth tax. So as has already been explained, there is a huge gap between the group which are calling the rich and the group which are calling the poor. And our current tax systems, as Dr. Leila was speaking towards the end there, we did make mention of how our tax systems have been inherited from uh, colonial masters, and we haven't defined our tax systems ourselves. And we have uh, adopted these tax systems, which have proved to be inefficient in terms of collecting revenue, but then at the same time, in terms of distributing the wealth within the within the continent itself. So we've seen a huge gap between the rich and the poor, as we as was shown in the table before. So our tax system has not been meaningfully able to distribute the the wealth between the rich um, and between the poor. So one of the solutions to this is the, the wealth tax which we've been talking about. The wealth tax which could potentially tax a high with those high net worth individuals and um, use those resources to redistribute um, the wealth on the continent. So our tax systems have been inadequate. When you look at income, income taxes uh, in themselves. So income taxes have not been very efficient in taxing wealthy individuals. So this is because wealthy individuals um, their sources of income is very, very diversified. It's very va valid. Um, so it's very varied. So when we're looking at income taxes, for those that are, let's say, in the working class, the middle class, you know for certain that on the income that you're raising, on the monthly salary that you're raising, this is how much you are paying. Um, for those that are in the informal economy, we do have presumptive taxes and they know how much they're paying. Whereas for wealthy individuals, so uh, I have an example here. So let's say you have a billionaire or a millionaire that never se sells their shares. So they do not realize the they do not realize the profits from selling their shares. That means that he's not liable to capital gains tax. So if this year a billionaire does not sell his shares, he's not liable for capital gains tax. So in the form of capital gains tax, he has zero liability. Then similarly for, uh, let's say again, for a billionaire, if he owns shares and they do not distribute dividends um, on, 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 on that equity, then it means they're not taxed the dividend, the dividend income. So you already see how, as opposed to income taxes, for those that are paying income taxes, you know for certain how much you're going to pay. Um, whereas for those that are wealthy, those that have diversified sources of income, uh, if you do not sell your shares, you do not pay capital gains tax, um, and they, that, that, that tax is not imposed on you, hence they have a lighter burden. Interestingly, I came across an article where Warren Buffett, one of the richest men in the world, was talking about how his tax, uh, how much tax he pays in terms of the burden that he has on tax is less than his secretary, the woman that works for him as his secretary, and you already begin to see how that is a perfect example of how our tax systems have been inadequate. 
because you find that those that are rich and wealthy, the tax system does not meaningfully capture them. Um, whereas those that are in the middle class and lower income uh, carry a heavier burden in the form of taxes. Then, um, yeah, so that now takes us to, into the design of wealth taxes. So when we look at the design of wealth taxes, the poor design of wealth taxes in the past is what has led to several countries abolishing it. So in Europe, for instance, um, wealth taxes were popular in Europe in the past, but as, uh, has, as was shared, there are only about four countries that are currently living wealth taxes uh, in, the, uh, in Europe. And it speaks to the design. So countries like Switzerland and Norway still impose wealth taxes. And these two countries together have more millionaires per capita than all the G7 countries. So you see that despite them still imposing the wealth tax, um, it still goes to show that a wealth tax can work because in Switzerland and Norway, they still have more millionaires per capita than all the G7 countries. I must add a caveat though that um, Switzerland is one of those that is known as a secrecy jurisdiction. So it does attract um, these high net worth individuals. That's that's just a caveat to add there. Um, hence why, as Dr. Laila was speaking, there's some millionaires that moved from Norway to Sweden. Um, so in terms of um, the credibility and the design of wealth taxes also, so high net worth individuals pose significant challenges to tax administration due to their complexity of their affairs. When you put wealthy individuals alongside, um, take for instance, corporates, you find that wealthier individuals are more likely to find creative ways of avoiding or reducing their tax liability, similar to the large multinationals and corporates who um, use aggressive tax planning uh, methods to reduce their, uh, their, their, their tax burden. Similarly, this is the same for high net worth individuals because they have access to uh, a lot of money because they can have offshore accounts. You find that they can... Uh, uh, they can come up with creative ways of ensuring that they reduce their tax burden. So this also speaks to this question that brings to question the credibility of uh, some of the designs of wealth tax systems that we've seen uh, in the past. And then that leads us now to a question. So if we are imposing a wealth tax, if we do impose a wealth tax, could it discourage wealth creators from creating wealth? And this speaks to now the economic impact of imposing a wealth tax. If we impose a wealth tax, is it going to chase away the millionaires that we have in East Africa? Are they going to move away and say, ah, let me go to another country um, because uh, I have a heavy tax burden here uh, in East Africa? So to respond to that question, I want to speak first to the goals of uh, a wealth tax. So. In terms of the goals of a wealth tax, what we want to do is reduce wealth inequality. So wealth inequality, again, we cannot overstate how this is a big, big issue because wealth is concentrated in the hands of a few. Um, and uh, that leaves a lot of people in poverty with no access to um, key essential and necessities that they need for their day-to-day -day lives. Um, so one of the goals of the wealth tax is to reduce this wealth inequality. And then secondly, uh, another goal of a wealth tax is to encourage productive investment. So if you impose a wealth tax in a correct way, if it is done efficiently, you can actually spur economic growth. Um, you can actually uh, encourage productive investment. And I'll explain, I'll explain how I have a specific example which goes into how this can be done. So if we want to achieve this, the wealth tax has to be very, very carefully structured in a way that it overcomes the practical challenges that we have seen uh, in the past in several countries, which saw them abandon uh, wealth taxes. So we, the conversation of the wealth tax is getting big today. It's not just here in Africa. Several countries in the in the in in, in the West and uh, the global North. Uh, several countries outside of Africa and the global south also are looking at ways in which they can implement a wealth tax. So if we want to do that, it has to be very, very carefully structured um, and it must overcome the challenges that we have seen uh, in the past. So for those that oppose the wealth tax, they oppose it for three reasons in particular. So they point to the failure in Europe. 
So many wealth taxes failed in Europe because of the poor design. Um, they were designed poorly. And as a result, you would find that even those that are not uh, that are outside of the bracket or outside of the target group were being taxed heavily. And uh, as a result, it led to a lot of uproar and many countries had to uh, abandon them. So it failed because of that uh, in Europe, the poor design. Um, secondly, we also spoke about this earlier on tax evasion. So critics say that if you impose a wealth tax, it would just cause the millionaires to either move and find a different country to stay in, or it would lead to them finding creative ways of ensuring that they do not pay that wealth tax where they underreport their wealth or several other ways in which creative ways in which they can reduce their tax burden. And um, lastly is the potential negative economic impacts where we say that a wealth tax can stifle economic growth because the wealthy are the ones that are investing within a particular economy. The wealthy are the ones that are creating jobs. So because of that narrative, if you are taxing them heavily or if you are moving them away, it reduces the amount of money that they have to invest. Um, it means that they shift away, which would cause a decline in economic growth. So those are the critics. But I want to show how some research has shown that a wealth tax can actually spur economic growth. A wealth tax can actually lead to people using their wealth in more productive ways. So it can actually encourage investment, it can actually encourage production. So a wealth tax uh, stimulates the use of economic wealth and it helps reduce national imbalance. How? I'm sure many of you are asking how. So I came up with uh, uh, this example. So if you pay close attention, let's say you have two people. So you have two millionaires. Each of them own 250 million, right? So we have two people that each own 250 million. One decides to invest in bonds, uh, in government bonds, so in treasury bonds. And um, another decides to take a more risky investment and invest in a business. So both of them have assets worth 250 million. And then uh, their return on investment, because a bond or a treasury bill is not as risky an investment, their return on the 250 million is 3%, which gives us 7.5 million. Uh, sorry. Yeah, which gives us 7.5 million US dollars. Whereas for the entrepreneur who decided to take a more risky investment, they ended up with a return of 125 million, which is a 50% return on what they had invested in this 250 million. So let's say we have a wealth tax uh, as defined by the previous speaker, Dr. Leila, when she was speaking. Let's say we have a wealth tax within this particular uh, economy and that wealth tax for argument's sake is 2% on assets above 50 million. You would find that the bondholder is going to have to pay a tax of, uh, of uh, 4.1 million US dollars. Whereas uh, the entrepreneur who has uh, 125 million return is going to pay 6.5 million. So when you add the total, the effective income tax rate for the bond treasury holder is around 55.3%. Whereas for the entrepreneur, it's only 5%. So you'd see that Automatically, if you're taking less risky investments, if you're holding your wealth in, um, in the treasury bills, for instance, here, you find that your effective income tax rate is higher than someone that takes a higher risk and goes into entrepreneurship. The effective income tax rate is 5.2%. Uh, 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 so you see how here, if you're going into economic activities that are yielding high investment returns, you will not only create jobs. This entrepreneur is not only creating jobs, um, he's contributing to economic growth. And in terms of the effective income tax rate that he's paying is actually lower, as opposed to those that just want to hold wealth and not contribute to um, economic growth, whose effective tax rate is uh, around 55.3%. So this is an example of how, if we have a wealth tax in place, it can, um, it can push holders of wealth to invest in uh, more productive ventures that will contribute to job creation, that will contribute to redistribution of resources, 
um, the government is going to earn higher levels of uh, tax revenue. Uh, and at the end of the day, it's a win-win at least for uh, everyone. So that is just an example of how uh, a wealth tax can contribute to uh, economic growth. And then uh, lastly, as I close, the imposition of a wealth tax is uh, can be very political. Um, so taxing the rich is 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 complex. So when we're looking at our our tax system, when we're looking at who uh, we are targeting with a wealth tax, you would find that um, our tax systems have tax benefits, tax reliefs, and research has shown that these tax reliefs that our tax systems offer are highly concentrated amongst a small elite. Uh, a small elite. Um, and this small elite that benefit from tax breaks uh, hold high levels of political influence. So it's our current structures, our current structures with the way that they are, benefit the elite, and it makes them easy for the elite to push for tax reforms that benefit them, as opposed to tax reforms that benefit those at the bottom. Hence why this, the, the subject of taxing the rich, the subject of imposing a wealth tax is not an easy conversation to have. Um, it must be backed by proper research, it must be backed by facts and evidence. So you would find that even in countries such as uh, Europe, in countries within Europe, you'd find that for many of the countries that abolished the wealth tax, it was because of the uh, political influence that the elite have. Because you'd find that in some countries, those that are funding elections, those that are funding politicians uh, are the same people who the politicians must target in terms of uh, imposing a wealth tax. So it becomes difficult now uh, in terms of the political dynamics of uh, uh, of tax policy. Hence here are you saying tax policy is very treacherous territory for um, politic, uh, politicians because at the end of the day, when we are talking about the wealth tax, we must respond to the question, who are the high net worth individuals that we are trying to ta tax, um, that we're trying to target with uh, this wealth tax? So to conclude on my presentation, wealth taxes can be very beneficial to the economy. Um, if, if, and only if they are done right. So wealth holders would be encouraged to show, to, to use their wealth to generate income rather than just keeping it. Because many people just hold wealth because there is no, you can hold 10 different, let's say for instance, you can hold 10 different houses and there's no tax that you're paying. If your tax system does not have uh, property taxes, for instance, there's no tax that you'll be paying on that. Um, so in order for, uh, in order to encourage economic activity, wealth taxes can do that. Um, so what we've spoken about shows how a wealth tax can be good or bad for the economy and its implementation. It's implemented, and that, that's the biggest, as I conclude, that's the biggest, that's the biggest thing, how we implement uh, the wealth tax can speak to whether it's going to be successful or not. So with that, Asanteni Sana, thank you very much. I hand over back to um, the moderator. Uh, thank you very much, Ishmael. That was uh, very exhaustive, a very exhaustive breakdown of uh, on all taxation, its advantages, the politics around it. Very, very, very impressive, Ishmael. Uh, I think you've uh, touched the issue of politics, and I think it's a, it is a, it is a huge challenge. In, as we all know, taxation is a political issue. Usually, the 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 the, 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 the victims or even the beneficiaries. At the same time, uh, the enactors of most of these uh, policies and laws uh, around taxation. So th that is very, 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 it was a very interesting presentation. I have seen quite a number of questions and coming through, and I'll just uh, encourage us, uh, the attendees, in case you have any question, you can post it in the q and I've seen uh, Dr. Laila answering some of them. So please, uh, I also saw a hand. But uh, before we go to the hands, I wanted uh, to first finish with the panelists, then uh, we can get to the hands. But just in case, uh, to add our audience, in case you have a burning question, in case you have a, a comment, you can just post it here in, uh, in the Q&A section. 
or even in the chat section. And now with that, uh, allow me to move on to the next panelist. And uh, this is going to be uh, Alan Murangira. Uh, once again, Alan, you're welcome. Uh, you're going to talk about uh, issues to do with inequality. We've seen from uh, uh, Dr. Laila's uh, a presentation and uh, Ishmael's presentation, the gap between the, the rich and the poor is so wide, and that's one of the biggest justifications of, uh, of the wealth tax. And uh, they have also said, touched on the topic of uh, the wealth taxes uh, contributing a lot to, 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 to the resource envelopes of uh, the countries, especially in East Africa. And uh, uh, Alan, as you discuss the aspect of inequality, Perhaps you can touch some of these issues, especially around uh, the, 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 whether this whole tax is going to solve the inequality problem, especially for the marginalized groups, uh, such as the young people, the women, the youth who are considered to be at the lowest end. Uh, you could uh, touch on some of those issues and uh, yeah, and relate them to to whether the wealth the wealth tax will solve uh, these uh, the uh, the problems of these marginalized, especially even uh, when we talk about business, uh, the people operating and uh, in uh, small and medium uh, enterprises, whether the the wealth tax can strike a balance for them to be able to compete with uh, the big dogs in uh, in uh, in, the, in the industry. Uh, you're welcome, Alan. Uh, how, how many minutes do I have? Uh, you have about uh, 10. Can we squeeze it to 10? I see you're already behind the schedule. Thank you very much, Drew. Uh, thank you very much. Please confirm that you can hear me. As introduced, I am here as Alan. I will uh, not be, I'll uh, try to share my uh presentation but technology is defeating me but i'm going to nevertheless make it and then i'll share a copy via email i've been given the task to, of um, discussing the issue of inequality and where the wealth tax fits in and for me i i think dr leila and ishmael have touched a bit of it but i'll start from the beginning and i think it will also touch some of the question that uh part of the question that has been asked um in the group or is the is um taxation is the role of taxation to redistribute wealth so for me i'm going to start my my presentation there that um when we talk about the wealth tax we're looking at the wealth tax in form of tax justice and i think dr Leila um quite uh, talked about this when we say that um tax justice in a sentence is that everyone should pay their fair share of tax the operative one being fair share of tax. So, and for me, that's going to be uh, where my presentation, the scope is going to be around to, to look at um, issues of tax justice, the role of tax as an, um, in terms of redistributing. We know there are about four major roles. Initially now they, they, they've, they've added another a fifth bar where we look at um, using taxation, even before we go to wealth tax, um, using um, taxation to get revenue for governments to get revenue. We've discussed why that is not working with other, um, the, the previous panels have discussed why that's not working with other forms of um, tax heads, income tax, corporate income tax, uh, VAT and all that. There is um, a role of taxation in um, repricing the way where we want to encourage or discourage investment or consumption or anything to do with that, where we use taxation to sort of um, uh, cause a change in the pricing of goods and services. Then there is the issue of redistribution. And I think that now sits at the core of what we're discussing today, that uh, one of the major um, roles of taxation is to redistribute um, wealth uh, within the, the, the populations. And will, a lot has been discussed why that, sh that should be done, but I'm, I think I'm going to elaborate more, especially when we're dealing with um, issues of inequality, who it affects, and then uh, what happens if we do not uh, do some, anything or something about it. And then, of course, the last one is... Um, the, the role of taxation is usually to also give people a voice because no taxation is done without representation. So it means that for all the taxes that we have in our countries, the political system, the political 
um, uh, all the um, all the political representatives that we send out as um, citizens, as young people, as women, as anyone other ones that actually are um, involved in the tax making process. So, whereas sometimes we are very mad at um, authorities, usually our representation, our voices come through when it comes to taxation. Um, when our MPs, when our legislators do that. So those are the major four areas, but me, I'll really drill more on the redistributive part of it. Um, so when we, it comes to inequality, I think, again, a lot has been shared, but I would like to start from a point that um, wealth and income inequality are the sources of all other inequalities. Now, you could think about um, any inequality that you've experienced any discrimination that has happened as a result of that inequality chances are or in most cases it has been as a result of either wealth or income inequality that has been then extended to to come to um areas of social life areas of um political life areas of culture uh, our cultural life but even every other aspect um gender race everything the problem usually starts with wealth and uh, income inequality so the disparity between how much wealth um, individuals hold, how much income they have, and then that then sips out into other facets of life. So that's the first, that's the starting point. But um, it was imperative that actually we thought out that issue of inequality because income and wealth inequality is the source of all other inequalities. So, and when we start from that point, then we know that we have half of the solution to some of these other things. So. The second thing I needed to highlight about inequality, especially wealth um, uh, inequality, is that it is not by mistake. It is by design. It's not we just didn't fall out of the sky and find ourselves in such a position. No, there have been deliberate efforts taken uh, to maintain um, or to to make sure that income is being um, or wealth is being moved from the poor to the rich and when we start from that point, I think then it, it's perfectly or it speaks to some of what Ishmael has been saying about um, the politics around um, income and wealth inequality. So it is not it is not by mistake. And wealth transfer has always happened. I'll give an example in terms of budgeted corruption that we know, for example, everyone is taxed from most of the countries we come from, taxed very highly as an individual. And then uh, we go through the budgeting processes and we know for a fact that people budget um, for certain contracts or certain, um, uh, certain contracts to give to companies that they already own and shift away that wealth from the people that already didn't have it. And in most cases, they're even reducing on um, they have a bit of authority from health, education, social protection. And then uh, we put in product in sectors that are not productive and are owned or are, uh, um, are managed by a few people. So inequality, wealth inequality has been deliberate and it has been by design. And before then I go to then how does this affect, I think most of the uh, effects have been talked about when it comes to issues around um, the opportunity cost that um, when a few people and I, I like uh, the report that uh, Dr. Leila um, uh, shared and the, well, there was something striking within that report that I thought I would also say that uh, these 10 people made more wealth um, during their first years of COVID-19 than they, they did the last 15 years. So, but wealth does not just um, appear it is created by someone, it is transferred to someone, it, you just don't wake up one morning and then you say you did. So these ten men, um, within just about a period of three years, created about 1.5 trillion um, US dollars. They would have six times more money than the 3.5 billion uh, people of the poorest people. So for me, again, that is part of the problem that some people have too much, others have nothing. But let me go to then why it is important that uh, um, vulnerable groups or people that have an interest to have to do something and advocate for ways of redistributing this wealth. Um, it has quite a number of reasons, but I'll, I'll just um, talk about three of them, uh, given the time that I have. 
um, one is that um, wealth tax or wealth tax will be able to help us um, deal with some of the challenges that we're having when it comes to financing our, our fiscal deficits. And um, as uh, the, the, the figures we saw earlier on from Dr. Nela's presentation show that um, the money that we're looking for, we have it within uh, within our economies. And whilst we don't re realize those resources, then we have challenges of date. We now have challenges of austerity. So it doesn't stop at being overtaxed by a young person. It goes beyond um, you paying um, uh, taxes everywhere on everything to government borrowing so that they can also tax to pay back the date. But worst of it is to come to sectors to have austerity to sectors that are critical to youth development um sectors like health sectors like um ICT, sectors like education sectors um that are critical so we do not have and yet we know that a few people are holding some of this wealth that could be um could be transferred and when that doesn't happen then we have now issues of social unrest we have issues uh, we've seen um, the Olivest uh, campaigns in France. We've seen um, here in Uganda. We've ever seen the work to work movement. We are seeing the conversations that are happening within Kenya around um, what happens when there is not enough resources uh, to finance critical sectors. It also has a challenge when it comes to uh, power dynamics. When you have when you have wealth, you have power, and power dynamics in a way that uh, power is exercised even within our families. Whoever has the wealth, then will exercise. That's why we have we're having issues of domestic um, uh, gender gender domestic violence, gender based domestic violence. We have issues of um, issues of not. Um, sorry, can I give two more minutes? Okay, thank you. I've been given two more minutes. Um, so, so I was saying that uh, wealth uh, goes to issues of power, power dynamics, and when we deal with issues of when we close the wealth gap, then we can have uh, responses to uh, challenges around uh, gender-based uh, violence. We can have responses to the climate change-related uh, uh, disasters that we are seeing within our countries and all that. Now, to finish, uh, and the question was, I think, as John asked, is it possible to have our staffs? Yes, it is possible. It is possible because um, the third era of taxation is about representation. It's about no tax policy is done without members of parliament passing tax laws. So it goes back to now as affected um, communities, of affected groups, what um, pressure we have to build, what will, political will do we have to manufacture to see that our voices are heard through the representatives um, that we say when it comes to taxing wealth. Of course, it's difficult because most of the times are the people that own this wealth, but I think it is worth uh, to say that uh, the other role of taxation is to have a voice. And I think one of the greatest countries in this world was born out of um, the, what we call what the, the, tea, um, the tea party, no taxation without representation. And I think that could be the starting point. Um, I will stop there. And then and I can build on when, when the time, time comes, comes for, for questions. questions. Thank, you. thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much. I like on uh, you uh, doing a good job on uh, dissecting on uh, the issue of income of inequality and uh, whether the wealth tax can be a good tool in uh, solving the issue of inequality. You talk about a number of things in. Uh, uh but uh since we are running out of time allow me just uh invite uh Rangirai Chikova to also give his uh his presentation on uh the the, the, the discussion uh, around our uh, wealth taxes and uh the issue of debt uh Ranga is very important especially that uh he is working with uh, the pan africa lawyers union we also want to hear from you, Ranga, about uh, the law, the role that uh, lawyers can play in, uh, especially since they are usually termed first, uh, first of all as the wealthy people. In some instances, they are termed as wealthy people, but also they are usually the representatives of the wealthy. They are the advisor, the ones who give uh, 
who give them that uh, information on what to do here and there, how they are, most of the times they are the ones who uh, give them the knowledge on how to plan their affairs and how to, you know, whether to be compliant or not. So they are very, very critical in the lives and uh, of the wealth people we are talking about today, who we want to, who we are saying we should be taxing. So uh, perhaps Ranga, you could give us uh, that perspective. First of all, the debt crisis, whether wealth taxes can uh, be a good tool in solving the debt crisis, but also the lawyers as uh, representatives, but also as the wealth themselves uh, and, and the role they can play in uh, pushing uh, this agenda of the wealth tax. You all come Ranga. Okay, uh, thanks uh, Ishmael and um, thanks to Dr. Leila and uh, Ishmael. Uh, for defining uh, wealth taxes and um, giving uh, the framing uh, to this issue. And uh, thanks to Alan for bringing in uh, the inequality uh, element uh, to this topic on uh, wealth taxes. So in the interest of time, I'm not going to uh, talk about uh, the state of um, debt in uh, Africa and uh, the state of uh, debt also in the EAC. But what I'm just going to uh, talk about is um, why uh, the issue of public debt uh, is an issue in uh, the East African uh, region, and also um, to ask the question on whether if uh, wealth taxes uh, are a silver bullet uh, to the debt crisis that the East African community is facing, and uh, the role of um, lawyers uh, in this uh, topic. So um, to begin with, um, East African countries, uh, they are at a vulnerable position uh, when it comes uh, to issue or issues of, uh, of debt. So research has shown that uh, in terms of uh, the various debt uh, indicators, uh, countries like uh, Kenya, uh, they are not uh, in a comfortable position, but however, uh, some of the countries uh, such as uh, Rwanda, Uganda, Tanzania, uh, they are at a moderate uh, risk uh, of uh, the debt um, uh, sustainability. But does that mean uh, we have to be comfortable given that uh, most of these countries are, are in a moderate position? So um, wealth taxes, uh, to begin with, um, we need to ask ourselves um, why we are talking about uh, wealth taxes. So part of this answer uh, is to say um, government, they have um, a number of revenue streams uh, where they can get uh, revenue to fund uh, different um, aspects of their budgets. Uh, but uh, these streams are not enough and they're inadequate uh, for government um, revenues. And uh, one of the reasons why countries are engaging in debt uh, is because of um, the inadequacies uh, of domestic uh, resource mobilization. Um, there are a number of revenue streams uh, that are being underutilized or not being utilized. And one of them uh, is uh, wealth taxes. That's why we are talking about uh, wealth taxes. And wealth taxes are part of um, what we call domestic resource mobilization. We talk of uh, domestic resource mobilization um, because it's one of the most um, sustainable and predictable ways uh, of raising uh, revenues uh, for government expenditure uh, in comparison to uh, other sources of finance, uh, such as debt, uh, and aid. Uh, these uh, sources, they usually come uh, with a number of um, conditionalities, and some of these conditionalities, uh, they impinge uh, negatively on uh, socioeconomic uh, development. So um, when countries borrow, uh, it means they need to, to repay uh, these loans. Uh, just like what I said, one of uh, the streams that can contribute uh, to the repayment of loans uh, are those taxes. So in the East African uh, region, we have uh, the Economic um, Convergence uh, pro Protocol, which requires that um, member countries, they should maintain uh, a fiscal deficit of 3% uh, of uh, the GDP, that is uh, by the year 2021. So what is um, implied here is that um, the fiscal, um, when we say fiscal deficit, uh, this is the difference between uh, the revenues uh, and the expenditures um, of the government. So this difference should not exceed um, 3%. Uh, percent. So in order uh, to reduce uh, this fiscal deficit, uh, one of the ways uh, that we can use is to increase uh, the revenues and uh, wealth taxes can um, uh, play an important role. 
uh, in increasing uh, the revenues, thereby uh, reducing uh, this fiscal uh, deficit. If we look at um, countries such as uh, Rwanda, uh, the richest 1% of the population, uh, it earns 20% of the national income of the country. And this 20%, uh, it translates to 6.4 billion. If you look at uh, the external debt uh, for Rwanda, uh, in 2021, it stood at uh, 6.5 uh, billion. So hypothetically, uh, what we can see here is that just the 1% of the population, uh, they are able to cover uh, the, the almost all the debt of, um, of Rwanda. So holding um, other factors constant, uh, suppose uh, the government of Rwanda um, impose uh, a whole tax of 2% on this uh, 6.4 billion income uh, that is held by only 1% uh, of the country. We can see that um, this 2% is gonna cover almost 2% of the total uh, debt uh, for, for, for Rwanda. Uh, this 2% might seem small, but given that uh, it's just um, coming from uh, a 1% uh, of the population, you can see that uh, it is uh, really significant in terms of um, addressing uh, the debt crisis. We move on to, to Kenya. Uh, this issue of uh, wealth tax, uh, it has uh, been the latest in the long list of efforts uh, by the new administration uh, to raise taxes uh, on the um, super rich. So um, a study uh, done by uh, Oxfam International, it has revealed that if Kenya successfully managed to impose uh, a wealth tax uh, on the super rich, uh, the government is, um, has the potential to raise 125 uh, billion uh, Kenyan shillings. This is equivalent to uh, the budget for social protection uh, in Kenya for two years. Um, this is a lot of money. And the implications of this uh, in terms of uh, debt is that Kenya could be in a position to uh, minimize uh, contracting loans uh, especially those loans that are targeted uh, for social uh, protection. If we come to Uganda, for example, uh, the Uganda Revenue Authority, uh, it is you launched uh, a specific um, unit uh, that deals with uh, uh, the tax affairs of um, the rich. So um, what has been uh, seen so far is that uh, on the payment side, uh, not only small, but um, the Uganda Revenue Authority has managed to raise a uh, significant, um, no, actually, they raised uh, small uh, resources, but the impact uh, of those uh, resources is very, very uh, significant in terms of uh, debt uh, management. Uh, in terms of uh, statistics, the total domestic tax payment uh, for Uganda has increased uh, by 2.5%. Uh, so this clearly demonstrates that um, if we impose uh, a wealth tax, uh, in countries who are able to increase um, financial resources for government. And if governments are able to increase uh, financial resources domestically, it means uh, their appetite uh, for external borrowing uh, may be uh, reduced. Uh, there is a study uh, that has been uh, conducted uh, in Germany. Uh, so this study it, uh, analyzed uh, the possibility of imposing uh, wealth taxes uh, on the top rich individuals uh, to deal uh, with the growing uh, debt crisis uh, that was in the wake of um, the financial crisis. So German, uh, it sought to mobilize uh, 100 billion. So from that um, study, the analysis that, they, that they've done, the economic modeling, ETC, uh, it was noted that uh, wealth checks uh, can actually um, raise uh, substantial amounts uh, of revenues uh, that can be used uh, for debt repayments and also reducing the appetite uh, for governments to, to, uh, to borrow. So there are a number of issues that we need uh, to note uh, when we talk of uh, imposition of our wealth taxes. Uh, one, uh, it's important to note that um, although tax, uh, wealth taxes are important and can uh, generate um, more or additional revenues, uh, they are not a silver bullet uh, to dealing with uh, the issue of debt. Still, government have to uh, rely on other revenue streams and also governments have to make sure they seal uh, revenue leakages. Uh, other presenters, they've talked about uh, tax evasion, tax avoidance, illicit financial flows. Governments still need to 
uh, make sure that uh, those areas um, are addressed. And then secondly, um, the environment uh, should be conducive uh, for the imposition uh, of um, world taxes. Uh, you know, when you introduce uh, such a tax, uh, this is the case of uh, Uganda, uh, there's a behavioral response. So the business uh, can respond uh, in a way to conceal uh, their sources of income, evade tax, uh, stash these taxes, you know, in our tax havens, etc. So we need to make sure that we have uh, sufficient and uh, adequate uh, measures in place to ensure uh, that we deal uh, with uh, the behavioral uh, response. Other issues that pertain to the actual design of these taxes, how they are going to be levied, is this going to be uh, a one-year thing, once-off thing, or it's something that is going to be uh, done uh, on an annual basis. So um, we have talked about all this. So given that most of um, the participants, we um, they are lawyers. So we need uh, to make sure that um, where do we locate uh, lawyers in all these issues of um, wealth taxes and um, on, 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 on debt? So lawyers, um, to begin with, um, lawyers, they are also um, part of the society. They are also citizens and they are equally uh, affected uh, by uh, the dwindling of domestic resource mobilization, uh, increases in debt crisis, uh, etc. So in these uh, regards, um, lawyers as professionals, they should use uh, their profession, uh, their expertise, their connections, etc. to contribute uh, to the development uh, matrix. So in this case, I'm just gonna focus on uh, the issue of um, all taxes. So to begin with, um, in my view, I think lawyers, they play a pivotal role uh, in assisting in the setting of parameters for high net individuals. Uh, lawyers, they work with these high net individuals, they give them advice, uh, et cetera. So um, <laughs> it's important that uh, lawyers use uh, this in the identification um, of uh, these. Then another, Angle or another issue that we might uh, need to explore is on uh, churches. You know, we have now uh, mega million churches, uh, millionaire pastors, etc. Do we also need uh, to tax um, these guys? Do they also need to be uh, defined as high net individuals? Also, considering that uh, the church uh, plays a pivotal role uh, in the development of our countries, for example, they complement. Uh, efforts of the governments uh, to provide uh, social safety needs uh, such as health, uh, education, etc. I think in all our countries we have these uh, mission schools, uh, mission hospitals, uh, etc. Um, another role um, that I see for lawyers is to advocate um, for these health taxes and ensure uh, that um, laws are watertight uh, in keeping illicit financial flows and uh, potential tax evasion uh and uh tax avoidance <clears throat> so um lawyers should also sensitize and encourage uh, their clients uh to be tax compliance uh, this, this is important uh, in enhancing uh domestic um resources um mobilization if domestic resource mobilization is enhanced uh countries have more uh resources uh, for the provision of social safety nets and this is important uh, in improving uh, the social economic uh, development of our countries. In terms of uh, debt enhanced uh, domestic resources mobilization uh, simply means um, less uh, reliance uh, on, on loans. As we all know, these loans, uh, they, have, uh, they impose a uh, heavy burden uh, on our citizens. So lastly, um, as part of their ethical conduct, lawyers can also call out uh, their colleagues who are engaging in these uh, schemes uh, that aid clients to conceal their sources of income and financial records for, uh, for, their, for their clients. So in, in this way, uh, lawyers uh, will contribute uh, to transparency uh, and accountability, uh, which is a key ingredient you know, for any uh, financial and uh, tax uh, systems. So to conclude with, um, wealth taxes are not a silver bullet uh, to the debt crisis. There are a number of issues uh, that also need uh, to be addressed, but um, wealth taxes, uh, they contribute or they have a potential to also contribute, uh, you know, they are part uh, of um, DRIM uh, strategies to uh, increase uh, domestic resources and reduce uh, reliance on um, 
external uh, data. I think I'll stop here. Thanks. I uh, thank you very much, Ranga, for that uh, comprehensive discussion. Uh, you touched most of the aspects I had asked for, and I think uh, I cannot ask anymore. But uh, since we are running out of time, uh, allow me invite our last panelist, Jacqueline, who is uh, standing in for answer so safe us. Jacqueline, can you hear me? Yes, I can, John. Please take it away. Thank you very much. Thank you, John. Thank you to all the panelists for the beautiful presentation. Uh, Mr. Rurindji's job was to highlight how wealth taxes are manifested in our laws in Uganda and also to look at the ESC, ESC perspective. So as earlier stated by most of the presenters, that is that um, wealth taxes, there are two, there are major types of wealth tax, and this is net wealth tax, which is applied on a person's wealth. And also there's, al there's also transfer taxes, and these are applied um, on, on, on the transfer of wealth, that net wealth is on the person's wealth. So we all know that wealth taxes were common in the 1990s. Uh, up until the 2000s in the OECD countries. And they have since dropped from two, 12, 12 countries to three as of 2020. And the countries that now have wealth tax in the OECD are Norway, Spain, and Switzerland. The, the most commonly cited justification as to why as to why the wealth tax was repealed is that um, they reduced savings and investment. They encouraged um, capital flight and fiscal expatriation, which is what most of the speakers have talked about, that this causes capital flight. The rich tend to move out of the country where they're being taxed, where the wealth tax is being imposed into other countries. And then also that uh, these taxes provided tax avoidance and evasion opportunities. They also narrowed down the tax base through the several numerous exemptions and reliefs that were given in the different in the different countries. So when you look at um, wealth tax in developing countries, and now this is how we look at the case of East Africa, several commentators and policymakers have argued that um, in order to generate tax revenues and to reduce income inequality in Africa, and wealth distribution, there's a need to impose a wealth tax on net worth of high net worth individuals and uh, MNCs that are operating in Africa. As earlier stated, uh, Uganda specifically has a unit, URA has a unit that focuses on these high net worth individuals and they are taxed at the normal rate. Just to mention is that Uganda does not have a wealth tax, but their taxes are spread across the different, the different taxes, and uh, we shall we, we, they are majorly, and they're also majorly progressive. We have capital gains tax, which is imposed on any disposal of non-depreciable assets at a given, at a gain where the consideration received exceeds the cost base, and the rate here is thirty percent. Then we have presumptive tax. Uh, in the interest of time, I'll not go into the details. We have presumptive tax, and uh, the threshold for presumptive tax is. Uh, 150 million Uganda shillings. And then we have withholding tax, of course, VAT. VAT also the threshold is 150,000 Uganda shillings. We have stamp duty, which is which is imposed on the different transactions and that is charged on the total value of the asset transferred. And of course, we have the rental tax, which is still a bit hard tax by the authority. Uh, it's, it's the, the rental tax for an individual is computed at 12% of the gross income in excess of uh, 2.8 million Uganda shillings per annum. So any amount below that is not taxable. Uh, in the case of Kenya, I think Dr. Leila mentioned this, is that uh, Kenya, there's a proposal or there is a plan in Kenya to to raise taxes from the wealth that is accumulated by the people who are called the richest in Kenya. Uh, and this is over, as, as opposed to getting revenues from workers and only traders. Uh, this would apply to all properties such as real estate, cash investments, business ownership, 
and other assets. Then South Africa, South Africa also, also investigated the feasibility of introducing an annual wealth tax in South Africa, and the tax would serve as a replacement to for the existing wealth taxes. These are estate duty, donations, donations tax, security tax, but it's, it's still debatable as to whether wealth tax should be implemented in South Africa. Tanzania also does not have a wealth tax, but has progressive taxes. So for East Africa, there is no country that at the moment has um, a wealth tax. Again, in Uganda, there was a proposal in 2009 to introduce tax on large tracts of privately owned idle land across the country. And this was uh, intended to encourage its productive use threshold its productive use and the threshold was for individuals that own over 320 square miles. It was also to make the land ownership more equitable, but this has not been implemented. It, it, was, it was a proposal and that was just a few, a few years back. There's a recent development in tax laws in Uganda, and that is the Convention on Mutual Administrative Assistance in Tax Matters Act of 2023, where uh, a pre-existing entity, as stated in the Act, is required to file a return if one has an aggregate balance of um, United States dollars of 250000 as of 31st December 2023. So this again is targeting the, 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 the rich, the rich to, to, to make those, to make, to declare their returns uh, based on, on, on their wealth. Then uh, the other issue we could look at is that um, the OECD, based on the challenges that um, the OECD countries had and why so many countries fell off and stopped using wealth tax or stopped imposing wealth tax, the OECD has uh, designed some tax design, made some tax design recommendations and I'll uh, quickly run through them in the interest of time to use progressive tax, tax rates to make them less distortive and fair, to limit tax exemptions and reliefs, exempting um, business assets with clear criteria restricting eligibility, and then to allow payments in installments for taxpayers facing liquidity constraints, regularly evaluating the effects of wealth tax and uh, also to establish rules that prevent international double taxation. We, we had earlier heard from our speakers that uh, wealth tax um, is, breeds double taxation. Uh, I will agree with Ishmael, the, the earlier presenter, when he said that we have to be very, very careful as, as we structure these taxes and um, how we implement them is very is, is very important. Um, yes, do we need wealth tax? Yes, and uh, I would agree that uh, wealth tax reduces income inequality, and this is um, through a wealth tax. Uh, the unequal wealth can easily be redistributed to improve public services such as housing, water, healthcare, education, infrastructure, and by targeting the wealth of high net worth individuals, African governments will be able to reduce the income inequality and balance the scale in favor of the low income African. Yeah, that, that, that will briefly be our presentation, but uh, my parting shot is a question that given the challenges faced by the OECD countries over the years, is the time different? Is the East African community ready for this tax? It, it, that will be our presentation. And thank you for listening to me. I thank you very much, Jacqueline, for conveying that message. Uh, that question is essentially what we are trying to answer here. Is the East African region ready to take up the wealth tax? Uh, of course, uh, we've had quite a number of insights from uh, Dr. Laila, from Ishmael, uh, from Alan, from uh, Ranga. And uh, I think the, the, the answer is a bit of a mix. 
It is, uh, it's 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 not a straightforward yes. Neither is it a straightforward no. I think we still need uh, a lot to do in that regard. But I've uh, seen quite a number of people in the Cho and A section taking part in the conversation, and I'm glad that uh, uh, my panelists have been able to answer most of these questions. I hope we have all been following. There's just a lot of conversation that has been going on. I unfortunately I cannot go through everything. But uh, there is uh, just to mention something from uh, Ruth. Ruth says that uh, we still need to solve the inefficiencies in uh, in uh, the revenue administration in uh, our different countries uh, in order to be able to raise more revenues. Simply imposing a wealth tax does not mean that uh, we are going to get uh, the revenues we desire if we do not deal with some of uh, these uh, some of these challenges we are facing at uh, with our revenue authorities, tax administration, especially. I think I agree with that. There are quite a number of uh, uh, comments here, colleagues. I just encourage us to read through them. I don't know whether there is something burning from the audience before I can just get back to my panelists to give their parting shots, but also to you, my panelists, I encourage you to, I, I'm sure you've been following uh, uh, what has been happening in the Q&A. You could, as you conclude, touch some of these aspects. I saw there were aspects of uh, inequality. Alan, you can deal with that. I saw there was uh, uh, some uh, comments or questions to do with the political economy and the economic activity around uh, the posing of the wealth tax. I think, Ishmael, you are well positioned for that. I've also seen... Uh, uh um i've seen ranga you've talked about churches and uh, the millionaires in the churches wow yeah but uh, i don't know that there's something burning from uh, the audience anyone i can give a chance just in a minute oh yes collins collins please go ahead Can you hear me, Collins? How are you? I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Thank you very much for the training. It's uh, very welcome, especially on the issue of uh, wealth tax. Uh, now, uh, I have uh, one question and perhaps a consideration. Currently, we have um, the capital gains tax in the whole of East Africa. And um, Kenya used to have the lowest rate at 5%, which has been increased to, to 15% uh, this from this financial year. Uh, I know the rate is higher in uh, the other countries in East Africa, the ones that are charging it. Uh, I would want to get, um, because capital gains is essentially taxing wealth. That's, that's taxing wealth. You are taxing big people with big uh, assets who are selling and trading, and uh, it's not trade. We are not talking. Okay. It's not a trade tax. Okay, it's a trade tax because a trade must happen, and then a gain must happen. I would want to know what the experience has been with other countries when you increase the rate uh, for wealthy people. Okay, I know the question was asked whether if we increase the rate, but let's let's get when Kenya tried to impose capital gains tax on the um, stock exchange, there was a capital flight. Foreign, foreign companies simply withdrew and went away and they've never come back. Now, uh, though that, that uh, element of taxation was removed from uh, the stock exchange. Now, I would want to know from countries uh, which are imposing higher rates of capital gains, which is essentially a tax on the, on the, on the wealthy, what their experience has been. Is there been litigation? Has there been increased compliance? Has the tax uh, yield uh, increased on what has happened? Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Collins, for that question. Uh, I don't know who can take this up. Uh, Ranga, Ranga, can you take this up? Oh, Ishmael? Oh, Alan? Um, I know Dr. Leila is Kenyan. stronger. Oh, I hope. Yeah, yeah. I, I know Dr. Leila is Kenyan. I don't know if she would like to respond. Uh, 
if not i could give it a go <laughs> yeah <laughs> that's a nice way to just throw me under the bus <laughs> <laughs> but i think it's a it's a good question that um uh, collins has asked i don't have the data with me in terms of how much in, in in taxes, especially particularly CGT, has uh, you know Kenya been um, earning since its introduction? But what, what I'd like, like to say is that, is that we need to um, have a very clear and distinct view on how we consider and define wealth taxation. So I've heard Colin say that you know capital gains tax is a form of uh, tax on wealth, but for me, capital gains tax. It's basically a tax on the profit that is realized from the sale of a non-inventory asset which was purchased at a cost amount um, that was lower than the amount realized on the sale itself. So the common assets that are subject to the capital gains tax in Kenya would be stocks, bonds, precious metals, real estate, property. So essentially, we're saying that capital gains tax is a tax on the growth in value of an asset. When we speak of um, wealth taxation, this is basically a tax on the total value of personal assets, which would include bank deposits, um, yes, real estate, assets in insurance and pension plans, ownership of unincorporated businesses, financial securities, personal trusts. If you own the Mona Lisa painting in your house and it's an original, if you have digital coins, if you have you know non-fungible um, tokens as well. It's the wealth tax. The difference is that it's levied or it's supposed to be levied on the total value of personal wealth or on the value of particular categories of assets. So that's the distinction. And that's why towards the start, I said we need to have a very clear definition and understanding of what really wealth tax means, because we can say if I'm paying any increase in, in, in the shares that I own, CGT, that's a form of a wealth tax. It's not wealth taxation, it's though. Wealth tax. We need to be that. That that clarity needs to be there. Yes. Sorry, back to you. Oh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Laila, about that clarity. I think it's a bit confusing. It's a, it, it brings. Uh, I mean, why would it just be a form of wealth of of a wealth tax? But it's not wealth a wealth tax. You know, it's a bit. Uh, <laughs> It's a bit confusing, but thank you very much for that clarification. Maybe just to give uh, uh, a perspective from uh, the from Uganda about uh, uh, the wealth tax that our colleague was talking about. I know that there was an attempt in Uganda to overhaul the capital gains tax system uh, in this uh, in, the, in, the, in the in the last uh, tax laws that we amended for this financial year. There was an attempt, and the the, the attempt sought to redefine the whole definition of what an asset is and basically an asset what from the from the attempted uh, amendment even a, a something as small as a pen or even a shirt could be termed as an, as, an asset but lucky enough uh, that, that, that 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 attempted amendment was rejected by uh, by parliament and it never went through but uh, thank you very much uh, Laila for 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 that uh, distinction between uh, forms of wealth tax and wealth taxes themselves. Thank you very much. So I, I don't know whether there's anything else. I think uh, we already passed the time we are supposed to conclude. Let me just hand it back to our panelists to give their parting shots, and then we can uh, call it uh, a webinar. Maybe uh, can I just start with you, Jacqueline? Oh, I think Jacqueline uh, is not with us. Can we go with you, Alan? Alan, you can go ahead. Um, thank you very much, John. John. I will try to also comment on the question, um, I, or the comment that I think put in the Q&A about uh, the wealth tax being uh, purposely to just uh, re uh, bring back resources that have been taken away from the continent because of the historic, uh, the historical challenges that have well, uh, that have been visited on us as a continent. And I, I totally agree. And from the beginning, I said that inequality, always inequality, is by design. That um, uh, there's been a consistent, um, a consistent 
um, pure ecosystem to move to get wealth or to get uh, resources from the poor and redistribute them or move them uh, to the rich. And I think uh, Faith in the comment section gave some of those examples, slavery, colonialism. Right now we are looking at uh, resource, um, natural, resource, um, natural resources being taken out and all that. And I think that's what has been happening. And um, to agree with the sentiment here is that yes, I think we we'll still need that sort of um, wealth tax to then redistribute um, redistribute that wealth within um, the majority of, of the population, and be, and uh, mainly because the alternative is what the, the alternative is what we are seeing in um, certain countries on this continent with agitation and changing leadership. The alternative is what we are seeing um, with the yellow vest movements, with the other movements that have are related or that are popping up as a result of. Um, inequality that has been perpetuated, um, especially starting with a distribution of wealth. So I think the alternative uh, actually is, um, in this case, would be worse. So um, I think I would agree. I would agree with with what Faith with what Faith is saying in the Q and A. Um, I would like to thank our listeners and those that have participated, and we look forward to more comments uh, and learning and peer learning from um, from our listeners. Thank you very much, and have a good evening. I uh, thank you very much, Alan, for joining us. Uh, can I move on to Ranga? Ranga. Uh, thanks, uh, John. Uh, so to conclude, um, all taxes, they are not um, a silver bullet uh, to the issue of uh, debt in East Africa. There are a number of uh, structural issues uh, that needs uh, to be addressed. Uh, we need to strengthen uh, the legal and institutional frameworks uh, on the issue of uh, debt and also on um, um, issue of uh, taxation. Um, however, um, all stakes, uh, it is uh, the potential, uh, but we need uh, to be smart. We need uh, to think deeper on how uh, we are going to define uh, these wealth taxes, um, how we are going to uh, design them, impose them, and um, administer them. Uh, otherwise, uh, thank you, uh, participants, uh, for listening. Thanks. I thank you very much, Ranga, for joining us and uh, sharing your views with us. Uh, we can't thank you enough for the for your insights as well. Uh, can I now move on to Ishmael? Ishmael? Yeah. Thanks. Thanks, John. Um, yeah, so I think for me in concluding is just to say that um, over the last few decades, we've seen that there has been an increase in the amount of uh, wealth that is held by individuals uh, as compared to the way it was in the past where governments would hold majority of the wealth. We've seen an increase now that a lot of health is held by individuals. And um, essentially this means that government's ability to provide essential public goods and um, fund sustainable development has to some extent decreased. And the, our current tax systems have not evolved the same way uh, the changes that we have seen to the dynamics in our economies have. So this conversation of a wealth tax is a contribution to the larger conversations that we've been having. For instance, on how we are taxing digital uh, enterprises, how we are ensuring that multinationals are paying their fair share of taxes on the African continent. And then we're bringing that conversation now to uh, private individuals are they paying their fair share of taxes? Is the tax system, does the tax system capture their wealth? Um, so I think this conversation of wealth tax is very important. I'm so glad to have contributed alongside um, the different panelists that we have here. So um, yeah, uh, uh, I was, um, I'm so happy to have been a part of this discussion. I'm looking forward to carrying this forward, um, even to the Participants, thank you for paying close attention and the questions that have been shared. Thanks, John. Back to you. I thank you very much, Ishmael, for joining us and uh, sharing your valuable insights with us. Uh, we look forward as well to carrying this uh, conversation forward. It doesn't end. I think it's just uh, the beginning. Thank you very much, Ishmael. Though I uh, have seen some comments that are requesting uh, for your presentation, I hope you can uh, share it with uh, uh, with Gabriel.
and uh, he can share it with uh, the rest of uh, the people who have been following. Thank you very much again, Ismail. So uh, Jacqueline, are you with us? Yes, I am. Yes, please, uh, just uh, your parting shots. Thank you very much, John. Um, I believe post-COVID, uh, the wealth inequality worldwide has, has gone up. And based on the principles of a good tax system, specifically equity, which is also re referred to as equality, uh, the tax system should treat like, like with like. Huh? So every member of a state should be able to contribute towards the support of government as nearly as possible. Again, in addition to what everyone has, has said, it is that uh, this is a conversation because it's, it's a development, it is the talk within the continent and um, we, need to, we need to get more insight into it. And I want to thank the team for giving the opportunity, specifically Mr. Birunji for allowing me to do this. And uh, it's, been, it's been good engaging with uh, people who have good, serious knowledge about this topic. Thank you very much. I thank you very much, Jacqueline, for coming in on short notice for for Cephas. Uh, uh, we are very grateful for the insights you've shared with us. Yeah. Uh, now let us conclude with uh, Dr. Laila. We conclude mm -hmm. where we started. Yes, thank you very much. So I don't want to add much. For me, it's to to thank everyone for their excellent presentations and to our participants for being here. My um, insights would be like, we have already talked so much about wealth taxation. We've given you so much of context justifications. We've talked about the challenges. Now, when you're practicing in your countries, um, I think what is important is that you need to ask yourself, do we need a wealth tax for East Africa? And if we are thinking about introducing the wealth tax for, for East Africa, um, how are we going to define it? How are we going to characterize it? What percentage are we going to add to it? How are we going to really classify wealth to be able to tax it? And I really want to thank um, Dr. Pacific Nionizigie, I think from Burundi, and she shared a link to the Finance Act from Burundi, whereby Burundi has actually introduced a wealth tax so let's try and look into this uh, Burundi legislation and ask ourselves, is this something that as East Africa, we should take forward or not? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Laila. I think it all comes back to us as uh, the East Africa Law Society on whether we can uh, and, uh, push for the introduction of the wealth tax across the region. And uh, it's good to, to hear that Burundi is uh, has introduced the wealth tax. Perhaps we can uh, do some peer learning from them and see uh, where the rest of the other countries in East Africa can, can start from if they are to impose uh, a wealth tax in their countries. The discussion, as we said, continues. Thank you very much to all the panelists who have been able to share their valuable insights about this topic. I hope this conversation today uh, shapes uh, uh, the development or shapes a number of policies across the region and uh, around uh, the imposition of all tax in uh, in uh, in our community. Thank you once again to East Africa Law Society for organizing this webinar and uh, to Gabriel and the entire team for making it happen. I would also love to thank uh, the chairperson of the tax committee, Safas Birunji in absentia for ensuring that uh, this webinar happens. And also, lastly, thank you the participants, the attendees. Uh, thank you for being here in such an afternoon. It's 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 been over two hours of uh, discussing, talking graphs, talking uh, pie charts, and you know, talking so many things, but you guys have, uh, have been with us till the end. Thank you very much. And I hope you've learned one or two things which can help you move into, I mean, help in your practice as uh, as practitioners, as lawyers, as uh, tax advisors or consultants. I, I hope that we've learned one or two things which we can push forward and which we can always say share with, uh, with our clients in uh, our day-to-day -day lives. 
So I cannot thank you enough for being a part of this and I would encourage you to keep attending the similar webinars. Uh, yeah, and uh, from myself and uh, from uh, Youth for Tax Justice Network, uh, we all can say is thank you for being a part of this. And I will look forward to seeing you again uh, in uh, future webinars. Have a good evening.